My job is to think about the end of the world. <laughs> it's a great job. <laughs> there is so much to think about. This lovely round lake is Lake Manicougan in Quebec, in Canada. It's about 70 kilometers across. And about 200 million years ago, a rock the size of Vienna, quite literally, hit in, uh, the Earth. That was not a good day to be around in Canada. <laughs> and of course, if it had happened today, it would have been an even worse day, not just in Canada, but worldwide. It would have ignited fires hundreds of kilometers away, and it would have lofted dust up into the stratosphere. Dust that would have remained for at least a few years, probably about a decade, which would have made it hard to grow any crops worldwide. We would be starving. It would definitely not be good if that happened. And of course, there are 884 known objects orbiting roughly around the Earth's orbit about this size or larger. None of them known to be on a collision course, but given time, one of them is going to hit. However, it happens rather rarely, probably just once every 10 million years or so, so the chances for tomorrow are pretty good. <laughs> back in 1918, the soldiers uh, coming back home from the uh, First World War were carrying something else with them home, influenza. The 1918 influenza was one of the worst pandemics we've ever seen. The virus, which was probably in a, transmitted from birds into in the human influenza genome, it killed 50 to 100 million people. That's more than the humans actually killed during the war. It would probably not have happened with us as humans. Having a war, weakening our immune defenses, starving many people, and then using modern railway transport to bring people around. And of course, the real problem is pandemics are still happening. The Black Plague might be in the far past, but we had some close calls with SARS and Ebola. And uh, there might be other things happening because of our biotechnological skills. We are able to construct new influenza viruses. And people actually, for research purposes, have made pandemic influenza in the lab. And let's just hope we can keep it in the lab. And that nobody with a bio lab at home thinks, hey, I can do that too. That would not be good, and that would harm us rather strongly. Another bad thing, which unfortunately is back in the news, uh, I grew up in the 1980s when it was not uncommon to lie in bed at the night and thinking, the missiles might be in the air tonight, and every other pop song on the top charts were about nuclear war. Then 1991 arrived, the Berlin Wall fell, and everybody forgot about the miss missiles in the silos which might be a bit of a mistake, because many of them are still there, and the world governance is not exactly looking that stable. Again, the threat here is not so much the direct effect of nuclear weapons, horrific as they might be, but rather the effect that happens when you get the soot from burning cities getting up in the stratosphere, causing a nuclear winter, similar to an asteroid winter. In simulations, uh, it looks like, again, for a few years, you can't do agriculture in the Northern Hemisphere, we would starve. This kind of lovely scenarios is what I deal with every day. And generally, existential risk, threat to our entire future, and global catastrophic risk, merely threat to much of the world, are really under-researched. There is more research on dung beetle reproduction than about uh, human extinction. And although I do like beetles, I collect beetles, I think it shows that our priorities might be slightly wrong. Indeed, we humans are probably much more dangerous to ourselves than nature is. And we need to deal with this better. The good news is many of these risks might actually be fixable, and we might increase our resiliency. Today, I'm going to talk about one little question that sometimes comes up. Many of these disaster scenarios are unlikely to kill everybody. Somebody is going to be holed up inside a big warehouse and with a can opener and containers full of ravioli. <laughs> they are going to survive just fine. Tasmania might be a rather nice place in the case of a nuclear war in the Northern Hemisphere. And some preppers, of course, thinking that they need to just stock up on uh, guns and uh, toilet paper and uh, the ravioli cans and hide in a cave in the mountains somewhere, and then they can take over the world afterwards. 
The question is, how many survivors would we actually need in order to repopulate the world if something went really bad? Ecologists care a lot about this. They call it minimum viable population. And it's a big thing in conservation biology. We want to understand how many pandas or tigers or other endangered animals do we need to have in our reservation in order to be fairly certain they are not going to die out. So ecologists are doing simulations. They're using software like the Vortex 10 uh, I got on my slide in order to calculate how many individuals are needed. Maybe we even need to move them into captivity in order to breed more of them because they can't survive on their own. And the biggest problem when you have a really small population is that you might run out of luck. The next generation, if you have rather few individu individuals, might have many more males than females, which means that the effective breeding population is much smaller. You might be unlucky with the weather. Climatic or environmental fluctuations might hit you. You might lose genetic diversity, which means that inbreeding is a problem. And of course, new disasters might happen. Once a species has a small population, it becomes much more vulnerable, and then it can start circling the drain, hence the name Vortex for that software. So, what is the human minimum viable population? It's interesting, there isn't a number in the literature. We actually don't know. I don't believe that Adam and Eve is a viable minimum population. <laughs> that happened with a bit of divine intervention. Uh, in the past, we know that hunter-gatherer bands uh, might have numbered in about 100 people, but it's unclear whether just a small band of uh, hunter-gatherers could actually colonize the world. In ecology, if you ask ecologists in general, if you have a large mammal, breathing rather slowly, needs a lot of food, how many individuals would we need to preserve? They would say, well, 5,000, give or take. This is kind of a standard guess, but it's extremely uncertain. For smaller animals that breed faster, you can actually get away with much smaller populations, but some animals need a lot more. So what can we do to figure out how many humans we need to really keep safe in the case of a, a huge disaster? One way is, of course, to try to look at uh, history. So we know North and South America was colonized by a rather small population. We know that because they underwent a genetic bottleneck. About 10,000 years ago, or a bit before that, depending on which archaeological theory you like, people moved over Beringia, the uh, land between Alaska and Siberia, which at the time was dry land. And a small pack of humans got down there. And it seems that it might have been as few as 70 people in the individual population. This is controversial, but it certainly seems that it was a very small group. So maybe the answer is 70 people. Not so fast. There might have been a lot of groups of people trying to move there, or at least moving around, <laughs> following uh, the game and fishing. And some of them succeeded. The last one, all the previous one had failed. They might have been much larger groups, but they went extinct with no uh, archaeological evidence. But one small group were successful, filled the prairies of North America, went across uh, Panama, went down into South America, and eventually became all the Native American people. So we can't use that number really well. Another interesting number is actually from South America, where there have been a number of small tribes that have been contacted by civilization. This has generally not been good for them. Typically, the population has collapsed very strongly after encountering civilization, not just because civilized people are nasty, but because we have a lot of diseases we have been spreading around the world that many of these smaller populations don't have any defense against. That means that we suffered tremendous disastrous collapse, and then we, many of them start to recover. Not all of them, but this gives us another number of how many people in, that survive the first collapse in a tribe are needed in order to actually recover. And in this data, it suggests it's about 108 people. Of course, it's much better if more people survive. It's even better if they have an, a, a large population increase, if modern healthcare really helps them, things move up. So this gives us another kind of evidence. We can, of course, look to totally different approaches. Some of my friends in the space movement are really can't wait to get away from this dangerous planet. They really want to settle Mars or maybe even go further away. So how many people should you put on your space arc? 
And uh, there is a number of simulations and models in the literature. More if they believe that, well, for a 200-year mission to the stars, where you have several generations living on your starship, you need about 150 people. Smith said, no, you need 40,000. It better be a big spaceship. Uh, a more recent paper, Morin argued that, yeah, actually, you want to avoid overcrowding because even a large spaceship gets rather overcrowded if people have too many kids. And also, you don't want to start out too in a, in a small because you get a lot of inbreeding. He believed 14,000 was necessary, which is a large spacecraft. Now, in this more science fictional scenario, we can also you know, think about all sorts of high tech assumptions. Actually, doing sex selection, so during most of the tri trip, it's mostly females and using uh, an insemination uh, to get genetic diversity, that might actually make the population much more stable. I did my own work because I was not entirely happy with this. So I did my kind of sim apocalypse. Not as good graphics as the modern uh, sim games, but uh, uh, quite an interesting topic. So I simulated small societies and I tried to simulate what happens if you do you agricultural society, hunter gatherers, high tech societies. I quickly found out that a lot of the data in the literature about the paleo demography, what, how many people lived in past society, was actually wrong. Not because archaeologists are stupid, but because we're not too keen on math. And as uh, my colleague Andreas During demonstrated in his PhD dissertation, there are formulas you can use when you find the ages of bones in a cemetery and calculate what was the population structure, what was the birth rate and death rate at different ages. And these formulas work really well as long as the population stays stable. This is in the classical papers by the mathematicians who worked it out. And nobody really reads those boring footnotes about applicability. So many archaeologists were just assuming that, yeah, populations were stable. But small populations, whether they're survivors in a post-apocalyptic world or a small crew on a spaceship or people living in early medieval South Germany, they are fluctuating, going up and down a lot. The population you find in the cemetery are generally much sicker than the population living in the village next door. And if the village is growing, you're not going to find a lot of young people. So I needed to take that into account. There are also all sorts of modeling complications, like what is the interval uh, that the women can give birth to? How do we organize our families? Because we generally want to avoid incest. Uh, who are the starting people? Are they an uh, average population from Earth right now, or are they selected to be really useful? So one can complicate this endlessly, which I have, of course, in my academic papers. But the good news is the ecologists seem to be roughly right. If you want a 90% certainty that the initial population will survive and thrive a thousand years later, 5,000 people is enough. This is much more than you can get into your nuclear bunker. It's a small town, or maybe a big uh, aircraft carrier, uh, but the small town is probably more likely to function really well. Obviously, if after the disaster people also have a lot of kids and they survive really well, it works better. Another important thing here is that it might be useful to split into smaller groups, partially because we don't get along with two large groups, even 5,000 people uh, are hard to deal with, but it's also safer because there might still be epidemics or other disasters around, so if one smaller group uh, fails, others can take over. But we need to stay in touch. A so-called meta-population is much more stable. Now, looking back, given all this, what should we be doing? Well, first of all, I think we should just get to know our neighbors. How many of us do know the names of all our neighbors and what we do? Uh, we might want to hug them. We want to be on friendly terms with them. Maybe not too friendly, depending on who they are. But the point is, in most disasters, people are saved medically by their neighbors. And in a crisis, they can really save you. Besides also storing up on uh, non-perishable food, which is a good uh, idea anyway if there is a small disaster, we might also want to actually work hard on our memory. Not just store all our information on DNA, which might last a very long time, but also in some solid books that you can read without electricity. Small populations have a hard time retaining the technology. Civil society in general is amazingly resilient, and that's where we should start, rather than getting a gun rack uh, and a cave. 
And we want to work on boosting our resilience as a society and avoid the threats. Because many of these threats, like nuclear war or an uh, artificial pandemic, are probably avoidable in other ways. And it's better to avoid them that way than having a surviving population. And finally, my job might be to research these things. But it's your job, everybody's job, to save humanity and our civilization. Thank you. <laughs>